everyone. Welcome. I'm James Milan, and this is a Talk of the Town legislative update with our state representative, Dave Rogers, who uh, covers uh, a good portion of Arlington and Belmont and a little bit of Cambridge in his district. And um, we have the privilege uh, of being able to talk to Dave regularly uh, several times a year to get an update. Dave, first of all, thank you for joining us and Happy New Year. Thanks. It's great to be here and Happy New Year to you. I uh, hope you're doing well despite uh, these very unusual times we're living through. Yeah, well, obviously doing well, <laughs> like so many other things, is, is, is you know, just feels different in, in, in context, uh, in the current context than it usually does. But That's we are sure. here and uh, happy to talk to you um, and hopeful um, still about uh, what 2021 will bring for all of us. But let's uh, ask you to kind of... Uh, just briefly revisit 2020, or at least uh, these last months since we uh, last spoke to you, uh, because there's been a lot going on um, in the legislature and in our state house, uh, despite the constraints that COVID has imposed on the way that you guys do business, you have been very productive. So if I can just ask you, you know, start wherever you want um, and just bring us up to date on what you see uh, as you know, the most significant steps that have been taken by the legislature um, in the last little while. Sure. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And um, yes, despite these uh, kind of challenging times, the legislature has adopted and adjusted to those times. We've adopted emergency rules uh, so we can vote. Um, it's a skeleton crew in the state house of legislators in the House and Senate running the sessions. And then most of us are at home uh, voting from home. And um, so that's very unusual because legislating is um, very much a, a type of work that involves um, uh, coordination and, and acting in concert with others. And so it's been challenging to, to do so from home, but we've, we've adopted and adjusted and uh, uh, so adapted, I should say. So I think um, some of the big things we've been able to do, one I would say is the voting law we passed. Uh, because of social distancing protocols, obviously uh, highly concerned about bunching at the polls, the potential for the spread of the virus. So we had to on the fly pretty quickly uh, 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 pass a new uh, voting law. And, and we did, and um, it was really well thought out. It had um, um, a number of provisions for mail-in balloting, which people really took advantage of proved to be very popular. We also um, uh, expanded early voting, both in the primary and the general election, a full 14 days of early voting, two weeks of early voting um, in the um, general election. And um, uh, one thing that I push for, I'm uh, working with the chair of the election laws, is that our town clerks could begin to tabulate the votes ahead of time before now couldn't reveal which way an, an election result was going for fear of creating bias in those who chose to vote on election day because we preserved election day voting but they could begin to tabulate them well why is that important because as we all sat on pins and needles waiting for pennsylvania and some other states because in those states they didn't tabulate votes early they didn't start counting the votes until the polls closed election day and so the whole country waited, uh, again, uh, you know, with bated breath for what would be the results of the election. And um, we didn't do that in Massachusetts. Uh, again, something I pushed for that our town clerk could uh, tabulate votes early. Anyway, long and short of it is we had record shattering turnout in Massachusetts. I think it broke all records. So in the midst of a pandemic, we had more participatory democracy than ever before. I would say that was a resounding victory in that new law we passed. Uh, we passed sweeping police reform. Uh, um, in the before, sorry, yeah. I'm gonna interrupt you. Before you move on, I did wanna just say um, the what you just described about some of the changes um, to the voting procedures that were kind of pandemic imposed in a sense, and you guys were, were pivoted quickly. That early tabulation, to me, uh, you know, I'll just note, it doesn't make any sense for me, to me, that we do it any other way. 
uh, you know, why not get ahead at least of the count as best we can, you know, get, yeah. get that count started. As you said, as long as the results themselves are not, you know, or preliminary results are not at all, you know, broadcast, then, you know, that's just making the clerk's job, I'm not sure if it's easier, but it expedites the process on the other side of the official election day. So hopefully, you know, those states that don't operate that way uh, may reconsider, um, you know, in the future. And kudos to you guys for, for doing it here in Massachusetts. No, it's a great point, uh, point well taken. And I'm originally, my native uh, home state is Pennsylvania. And I knew following the election closely, as I imagine many were, that Pennsylvania uh, was going to be truly a key this year. So I went down to Pennsylvania the final five days before the election uh, and campaigned for Biden Harris, the Biden Harris ticket. Um, you know, wearing a mask, going door to door, handing out literature, uh, all sorts of things. And then on election day, I was what's called election protection, where I received a very lengthy training. It was like a three hour training session and be at a poll location to, um, uh, and then they had a, a, a central place with election lawyers where if I saw any irregularities, any problems uh, to report them in. And so the reason I mentioned that is I sort of um, was talking with other activists, Pennsylvania activists uh, in the Democratic Party, and they passed their election law last year. And so the pandemic hadn't hit yet. I mean, not, I shouldn't say, shouldn't say last year, 2019. Now that we're in a new year, 2019. Yeah, okay. That we, we passed ours in 2020, Pennsylvania did theirs in 2019. And that there was kind of, a, I, I don't know if we wanna get into all the details of that now, but they explained sort of the political trade-offs that were going in the Pennsylvania State House and State Senate that led to the law being written the way it was. Um, Democrats did push for early tabulation, Democratic state legislators in Pennsylvania. And so uh, I think it's really important and hasn't been said often enough that you know Republicans have complained, gee, because, uh, you know, there was the so-called um, mirage where Trump was up in Pennsylvania, but then as the mail and I mean, excuse me, um, yeah, as, as the votes were tabulated uh, in places with heavy mail-in voting, you know, Biden took the lead. And the Republicans were complaining, like, how could this be? Well, it's because your Republican-controlled state legislature set it up that way. Exactly. So they're complaining. And it was both the House and Senate in Pennsylvania are controlled by Republicans. So I don't mean to go off too, too much on that, but I mean, no, I I'm actually just, glad I was glad there. I asked you to, you know? yeah. I'm glad I asked you the follow up question because we wouldn't yeah. have heard that about your yeah. experience going down to Pennsylvania. And I think that that's that is of interest uh, to to me for sure, and I think to our our, our audience as well. Yeah, and it was a little uh, fraught. I mean, you, you know, I mean, there was predictions. I mean, we saw what happened tragically on January sixth, the rioting at the Capitol. But I have to tell you, uh, you, you know, following the news, you, there were concerns there might be violence around the election itself, and going to a swing state like Pennsylvania, where G G James Carville once described as. Uh, Philadelphia on one end, Pittsburgh on the other, and Alabama in between, <laughs> you know, and they have a lot of militia groups, and to be honest, doing election protection work uh, down there um, it caused me, you know, I wasn't too worried about it, but I, it gave me a little pause, but in the end, um, well, you know, we, I mean, certainly Pennsylvania was a front line, an absolute front line in, for this particular election, both in terms of, you know, it's, decisive impact on that election, but also just what you've just describing, the fraught situation that we were all aware of leading into uh, the election and obviously on the other side of it as well. So just really interesting to get your perspective as somebody who is right there. Yeah, I was happy to play my part. And obviously we got a big win and happy to see my original uh, home state of uh, Pennsylvania come through. And and uh, obviously, uh, you know, I know this is taped to be broadcast later, but you were here on January 19th and uh, uh, tomorrow we'll have a new president and it uh, can't come soon enough. I wish there was a fast forward button I could push, but we'll have to wait till tomorrow at, at noon. And um, a feeling that, yes, a feeling that many of us, you know, would have uh, or, or a, uh, you know, an, a mechanism many of us would have longed for from March on. Fast forward, please. Well, I, I would have, yeah, for four years, but you know. Yeah, uh, that too. 
at any rate. All right. Um, anyway, let's let, gonna, let us get, you know, I interrupted. Let us move on. No, that's fine. So another big piece we did is police reform, obviously. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, very powerful, the killing of George Floyd and, and many others, and uh, a pattern of systemic racism uh, that's gone on for a very, very long time. And um, we took it up. Uh, it was controversial. Um, the, um, to give you a sense of how controversial, um, I will tell you that 34 Democrats in the Massachusetts House voted against doing police reform. So it's interesting. I frequently try to um, explain to constituents in my more progressive district the interplay and the dynamics politically in the Massachusetts House. And um, at times I kind of struggle to articulate and fully explain the different districts around the state, how the Merrimack Valley or the South Shore may send a Democrat, but a much more moderate Democrat than would come from Cambridge or Arlington or Belmont or frankly, uh, out in Western Mass, the college areas, you know. Um, right, it's not quite what you were saying about Pennsylvania with Alabama being between, you know, these various liberal polls, but, but you know, what, what I hear you saying and what I've noticed myself is that that democratic um, majority in our legislature in general does span quite a bit of, you know, of the political spectrum. Uh, it really time. does. And um, that's been eye opening to me in my time in service in the House is, uh, you know, sort of go there and uh, I come from a certain part of the state and you can um, mistakenly assume, well, I, you've got a D after your name, you're a Democrat. So I imagine you and I probably square up on almost all the issues or, and then you get to know some of your colleagues and um, you find out or, that they are Democrats and, and, and do vote with the Democrats on, on a lot of things. They're solid Democrats. But, um, you know, they're, they're not liberal Democrats. They're not progressive Democrats. They're not. And um, so 34 Democrats, there's 160 of us. So all the Republicans and 34 Democrats voted against the police reform. Um, and so but we, we got it through. And it, it was really a landmark piece in that it, um, for the first time, establishes a truly independent certification process, a licensure, licensure process for police. They can be decertified. That agency, that new agency has sweeping powers, um, subpoena powers, investigatory powers. Um, so that was a pretty dramatic piece. We put significant limitations on the use of force chokeholds, um, rubber bullets, tear gas, all sorts of um, uh, limitations on the way police can use force. Um, we uh, put limitations on so-called no-knock warrants. Um, and we put in place a whole series of additional training measures. Uh, and to be fair to our police, the truth is often now police are going on calls um, that involve mental health issues. And um, it's funny, I just did a, a Zoom meeting, uh, a forum with the chief of police in, in uh, Belmont, another part of my district, um, uh, really a, a very strong, a good, thoughtful police chief, uh, Jamie McIsaac. He put out a very strong statement after George Floyd was killed. He's very progressive in his thinking. But he made the point, you know, our officers are frequently going to homes where maybe a person is experiencing significant mental health problems bipolar, depression, anxiety, the, the full range of, of issues. And as a consequence, um, that's a very challenging environment for a police officer. And what he wants to do is hire social workers. I think Arlington has social workers that's right. in the police department. Belmont doesn't have any. Yeah. And so he made the point that, look, we want to address these challenges. But um, uh, so anyway, the police um, bill that we did will have training on for officers on how to deal with these uh, very difficult situations. So um, they're really, I'm, I'm leaving out 15 other things. I mean, one piece was a, a part that I wrote on facial recognition to limit the use of facial recognition software. Uh, we know that it's biased against people of color and women. Uh, the police here in our state were using it um, by going to the RMV, the Registry of Motor Vehicles, without a warrant and sort of rifling through their system to do facial recognitions, 
facial recognition uh, searches. And um, uh, so we uh, wrote a strong bill that actually originally required a full warrant. Uh, Governor Baker amended the bill. This is part of the problem of the 34 Democrats who didn't vote with us. We didn't have a veto-proof majority. Mm -hmm. That gave Governor Baker, our Republican governor, more power or authority to amend the bill, unlike a U.S. president who can only sign or veto. Mm -hmm. uh, in most states, including ours, our governors have a third option other than sign or veto, which is to amend. So uh, Baker sent it back with amendments and made it very clear that if we didn't go along with substantially with his amendments, he would veto it. And then we didn't have um, right. you knew you'd... the majority. So we you agreed to some of his amendments, not... including <laughs> one that kind of, right, exactly. Including one that watered down the piece that I had uh, brought forward on facial recognition. It's still good. There is now some limitation on how law enforcement can use the software. And it brings up both civil libertarian concerns of uh, um, uh, Fourth Amendment search and seizure without a warrant, but it also brings up um, bias-free policing or uh, uh, systemic racism issues in that the algorithms that the programmers use to develop this software, I was later revealed, I think were mostly based on Caucasian features. And so now even Amazon and other big tech that helped design the software have admitted that it's flawed, that it needs to be revisited. I think Amazon announced it for, it would put a moratorium on even selling their facial recognition software to law enforcement out of concern. So um, anyway, so the, the police reform bill has- Yeah, so uh, let me-, let me really, It's really a strong bill. Yeah, before we move on, well, I guess you just said it. I, I wanted, you know, with the understanding that, that there was, some modification of it uh, as a result of the governor's input, input, et cetera, that as you say, 34 of your Democratic colleagues did not vote for it. Um, in the aggregate, it does sound like you agree would agree that it is a, a good bill, a strong bill, and one that you stand behind. Absolutely. I mean, it makes truly sweeping changes to the way um, law enforcement uh, does its work. Um, and, um, as I said, I think some of it, I think as law enforcement gets to know the bill and what's in it, um, they'll like a lot of it. For instance, better training on how to deal with difficult situations. I mean, uh, it really was, I, I thought, thoughtful um, and, and pretty well structured. Uh, you know, the police will still be able to do their work in public safety, but uh, it puts uh, new teeth in sort of regulation and licensing and, and the ability uh, with problematic officers to uh, decertify them so they can't police here or frankly uh, anywhere else. And so um, we, we could devote a whole hour forum to the, um, I've left off quite a few provisions that are in there. Um, we have, a, I guess, want to cover a fair amount of ground, uh, but it, it is truly, I, I, you know, choose your word, landmark, breakthrough, whatever. Uh, pretty profound shift in how our law enforcement will do its work in, in our state. Well, as you said, we are expecting or asking you to cover quite a bit of ground in this half hour. And we do understand that that means that unfortunately we're not gonna be able to delve as much into as much detail as we would like. Um, yeah, and I have a constituent newsletter I send out once a month and a website and with links where people can drill deeper if they really wanna understand right. in, in a little more detail. and you know, my personal cell phone is published, people call me and I'm always ha happy to talk in more depth and, and people do uh, reach out. So, uh, but uh, I think for the purposes of our discussion, we've covered a lot of the big things that are in it. You know, another major thing we did uh, was a climate change bill. Again, uh, really a breakthrough, a pretty sweeping bill that um, would get the Commonwealth to net zero emissions by 2050. And um, the previous bill that was in law that was in place was the Global Warming Solutions Act, GWSA. And um, that set a benchmark of 1990 emission levels and said that we would get, bring our emissions down to a, a, a certain percentage of that, uh, below that. And so this is sort of the next generation climate legislation that goes beyond even the Global Warming Solutions Act to get us to net zero emissions. Uh, it uh, will spur renewable energy. It has uh, expands wind energy 
for the first time ever, it has an environmental justice piece so that low income and minority communities are not disproportionately harmed uh, by environmental um, degradation and, and the siting of plants. And um, so again, another bill, it makes um, municipal light plants. There are 41 uh, municipal utilities throughout the Commonwealth. They're different than the IOUs, the investor owned utilities like Eversource. And we mandated that those 41 uh, municipal utilities meet the same standards on renewable energy that the IOUs. Uh, we increased what's called the RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard, the percentage uh, of clean energy, renewable energy that the big utilities now, all the utilities need to have as part of their energy mix. I mean, this was a huge <laughs> bill. And again, I could, there's 12 other provisions in that as well as a comprehensive bill. Uh, unfortunately, as you may have heard, you may have read, uh, the governor vetoed it. And the way that worked is the conference committee between the House and the Senate negotiated a final agreement. That took time. It's a complicated bill. Um, energy policy is, is inordinately complex. Um, but they got it done, got it to the governor, but um, he it was at the end of the session. And now we've started a new session. So by law, the governor has 10 days to review it. Uh, he he waited till the 10th day and he vetoed it. So the House and Senate promptly came out and said, and, and we couldn't override it to finish the circle of, of how that works mm -hmm. uh, because a new session had started. And can so you override it in the new session? It, uh, well, no, the, oh. that is the end of the session. Any legislation from the previous session. You have to session, reintroduce. Uh -huh. We have to do it, over, but we will. Both the House and Senate leadership came out and said right away, uh, we will take this up. I think we'll take it up very early. I think we'll put it on his desk again. And this time, if he vetoes it, we'll be at the beginning of the session. We'll override his veto. So it, it will happen. It, it, it's right. We're, we're, right. Right. We're able to speak about it as if, you know, it's not yet passed, but you're, you've outlined why we can be quite confident that it Highly will. confident that. Can I? Uh, can I quickly ask you something about this, Dave? Um, the the soundbite that all of us would have heard already and that you have repeated is this idea of net zero by 2050. Right. That is a shorthand for a whole lot of work and a whole lot of content in that bill, I understand. Right. But can I ask you, um, when that is the case, when you have legislation that comes out and that is the goal, um, are, what's, what is the point of something like that? Is it literally that we are going to marshal all our forces to getting to net zero by 2050? Or is that more an aspiration that then drives a lot of specific kind of policies that come? No, it's not aspirational. It's the law. It's a binding uh, law. And every five years, the way the, the law is written, uh, what will become the law, um, is that uh, there'll be measuring points. Um, I'll uh, let folks uh, know if you didn't, we're, we're lucky in Arlington and that we have the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs lives right here in Arlington. Uh, Secretary Kathleen Theo Harides uh, is actually my uh, constituent, lives in the part of Arlington I represent. She's Charlie Baker's Secretary of EEA. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they, her Twitter handle, if you want to check it out, is Climate Katie. So she's really uh, forward thinking about uh, uh, climate change and environmental issues. And they've already begun to map and model emissions uh, throughout the state from all sources in, in anticipation of then uh, implementing the new law. So um, um, I think, you know, we we can be uh, hopeful and confident that we're going to have a law that uh, has strong teeth to it, is binding. And one of the big debates that uh, goes on in the environmental community, and it, it's an honest, legitimate debate, is net zero versus 100% renewable energy. And by the way, there's some overlap because to get to net zero, you are obviously going to have to ramp up significantly your renewable energy. And um, um, one of the challenges that many experts, and there's vigorous and honest debate about this. I, you know, I, I want to make that clear that um, those who have some 
qualms or, or concerns about 100% renewable is that one, our current grid is not able to handle um, 100% renewable energy um, platform. And then two, that we don't have sufficient energy storage capacity yet mm -hmm. to get us to 100% renewable. I'm sure you've heard this. Um, you know, you only get solar energy when the sun is shining. You always get wind, you only get wind energy when the wind is blowing. Um, and but what if what if you could store that energy? Uh, there's pioneering work going on uh, throughout the country, throughout the world. Um, even we all see the Tesla, the cars. Uh, what people may not know about Tesla is they're very uh, deeply involved in studying and developing energy storage technology. Right here in Massachusetts, uh, we have um, a lot of companies looking at it. Matter of fact, another constituent of mine in Arlington, uh, Emily Reichert, who's a, a, an outstanding leader of Greentown Labs. That is the largest clean energy incubator for tech companies, small tech companies, in the entirety of North America, so including Canada and Mexico. And I visited several times. It's where Ed Markey went to announce the Green New Deal. He announced it in Washington, DC with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and then came to uh, Massachusetts to do a launch. I was there with him uh, when he did so at Greentown Labs in Somerville, again, which is led by an Arlington resident. And so, um, uh, but, to get to 100% renewable energy, we, we face technological challenges. And that's why there are many um, um, ardent, um, um, passionate advocates for, for tackling climate change who think net zero is an equally effective, if not more effective way to go. But again, that is a real debate in the environmental community. Um, uh, my point is with the net zero approach that we took in the legislature, uh, it's not like never the twain shall meet. I mean, again, to get to net zero, you're gonna see renewable energy go way up. And uh, we have a new incoming speaker of the house uh, just uh, took office and he gave sort of a maiden speech where he set out his priorities. And like number one was wind energy, where he said, there's no reason that we shouldn't try to lead the whole country on wind energy. We have um, many megawatts have already been authorized. Um, 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 so I think we're going to see, um, a, a huge ramping up, um, of, of wind energy in our state. That's great. You know what? We have about three minutes left. Sure. Is there anything that you can touch on in that time? Um, and we'll, we'll forego for the moment kind of looking forward. Um, and we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that next time we get to talk to you, but let me shut up and, and give you the last couple of minutes. Well, um, you know, I, I guess one other thing I'd mention is we did uh, pass something called the Roe Act. Obviously, with uh, uh, Trump appointing three of the nine Supreme Court justices, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, um, it's unusual for a one-term president to get three picks. Uh, Jimmy Carter was a one-term president. I don't think he got any picks. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see uh, two-term presidents will get two, three, maybe four. Uh, very unusual, just the way, of course, one of them in, is a stolen seat from Merrick right. Garland, right. who looks, like, looks to be uh, coming in as our new attorney general. But what's my point? There are many advocates in Planned Parenthood, in NARAL, um, people who study law and policy in this area, believe that the new Supreme Court majority is poised to either overturn Roe versus Wade or, uh, or, or limit it in, in dramatic ways. That's actually what I think is more likely, but whether it's overturned completely or limited severely, um, uh, what the public may not know is that wouldn't automatically ban uh, a choice or abortion around the entire, it would devolve it to the states. And so um, in anticipation of that, and with the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the House passed the Roe Act, which will codify the right to choose and expand it here in Massachusetts um, in a couple key ways. Uh, for instance, the fatal fetal anomaly. If um, a woman in, uh, gets the tragic news that uh, the child cannot survive outside the womb, uh, she can terminate the pregnancy. Um, and um, also the age at which um, um, younger people need to get consent from their parents has been lowered uh, to 16. 
below 16, they would still need either judicial bypass or consent. So that was a big breakthrough. And again, that, that's a hard uh, bill to move. Uh, obviously, choice and abortion is a controversial issue, but we got it done. The governor vetoed it, but we did have the votes to override the governor on that. So that was big. And then, of course, we have um, the coronavirus, and um, we um, have done a lot uh, in the legislature to help. Um, a lot of the powers to address a public health emergency are with the governor. Matter of fact, as a lawyer, one thing that has struck me, and it's pretty remarkable the power the governor does have, it's under the Civil Defense Act. Uh, it's been litigated, it's been tested, because as you know, there are essential and non-essential businesses. And some of the businesses and business groups uh, representing uh, businesses um, that were deemed non-essential uh, litigated the matter. How can the governor in a free country uh, with free market capitalism, um, just shut these businesses down. And um, so it's been litigated and uh, the judges have cited that during a public health emergency, the governor has these powers. So um, I'm thinking of that now more with the rollout of the vaccine. And uh, we've seen extremely problematic um, uh, in the early going of the rolling out of the vaccine. And um, that has been, um, I've been, pushing the governor, working with other reps and senators. Um, uh, you know, I, I think this whole coronavirus pandemic has shown us how important it is, how important government is. You know, we need a thriving private sector for innovation and the dynamism of, of creative, um, creative in, innovation in our economy to create jobs. And, uh, but equally important, Equally important is that we have an outstanding, well-functioning government. And if big picture, and I know we're getting near the end of our time, big, and I think about this stuff a lot because I, I work in, in public policy and politics. Uh, even laying, putting aside uh, Trump, um, we have seen for 40 years now the denigration of government, uh, that uh, we need to cut it, we need to limit it. And if you ever needed Exhibit A for the importance of a well-financed, well-managed, um, thoughtful people, outstanding public administrators, outstanding public leaders, it's, I give you COVID-19. And we have seen such an epic failure uh, by a Republican administration. And I, I see this as a larger story of not just Trump, but the last 40 years of um, really uh, kind of giving government a bad name and always wanting to cut it and limit it and limit regulations. And uh, the truth is uh, we're finding out that having a good Center for Disease Control, having a good National Institutes of Health, having good state and local public health departments uh, is so vital, I would say, to, uh, to our entire society and our economy. Because if you look at other recessions, I was an economics major and worked for an economic consulting company in the earlier part of my career. Other recessions were caused by out of the financial sector, out of Wall Street, or out of housing, or go back to the 70s, the oil shock, mm -hmm. OPEC, and the oil embargo. In other words, they happen in the financial markets or other leading economic indicators are disrupted. Think of this. This is a public health recession, a public health recession. And... Um, so uh, I, I don't mean to go on at too great a length about that, but it, it's further evidence to me that we need outstanding uh, public leaders. Uh, you know, when people talk about, well, we need to ra raise progressive revenue to invest in infrastructure and in education and reforming different systems, that's every bit as important as private sector investment, in some ways more so. And um, as you can tell, I get pretty <laughs> passionate about that because I really, um, to meet the challenges of this new century we're in, uh, we're going to, we really have to learn lessons from what's happened here this last year. There's so many lessons to be learned and um, I'll be trying to incorporate them into my work as a state representative. And I'm so happy a new administration is taking office tomorrow. Um, at, at we're going to have a long, difficult road ahead, but I think we can sort of breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. And um, so I'll look forward to partnering with my constituents uh, on the road ahead uh, as we meet the challenges to come. 
I'm looking forward to meeting those challenges and in a new session that's just begun. And uh, I look forward, you know, my, as my cell phone's public, my website, uh, there's yep. my email. I look forward to hearing from folks and, and working. Um, and I apologize, I'm at home and I don't know the angle of the camera. <laughs> no, I don't know if no, that, no, you know, it's a little no, weird. No but. problem, babe. Um, in fact, you know, we blew right by uh, the, uh, the 30 minute limit that I had promised you and, you know, and my <laughs> producer uh, that we would adhere to. But, you know, the, the reason, you know, I'll stand by uh, the reasons for doing so, which is um, you have a discursive style, as I'm sure you're well aware, but through that, we get real insight into a lot, you know, much beyond uh, the, you know, simply what is going on. Insight into how, you know, your own values, how you are approaching your job, what you think uh, is most important or most dysfunctional, et cetera, uh, which I think is illuminating um, for all of us. Um, and also you well, just, you. you know, you, you, you have a lot going on in that head of yours and it's good to, 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 to hear uh, that uh, in, in, you know, as, as it streams out, it really is. So I appreciate um, you taking this time. We'll get back with you soon enough and um, it's kind of see how these first months of the new administration go um, and what effect that has, again, on, on Massachusetts in terms of public health, in terms of the economy, as you said, this public health recession that we are all uh, dealing with and hopefully moving away from uh, uh, in the coming months. So I look forward to that, but appreciate your time with us today, really. Thank you very much. I enjoy it as always and uh, look forward to continuing to have a dialogue on uh, issues that we, that we all care about. Appreciate it very much. Um, been, I've been speaking to Dave Rogers, our state representative, one of our two state representatives uh, here in Arlington. And uh, this has been a legislative update and part of our Talk of the Town series. So thanks again to Dave Rogers and thanks to you for joining us. And we will see you next time.